What is up everyone, Movie Man back again with another Horror Revisited episode and I'm going to be carrying on my Scream movie review series here and we are at Scream 4. I have reviewed Scream 1, 2 and 3. If you want to check them reviews out, the link will be down below and after this video I'm looking on ranking the whole series from worst to best. Now this is a spoiler warning guys, I do talk spoilers in these videos, I like to go a little bit in depth about the movie. Everything I like, everything I don't like. So if you don't want to know who the killer is or who gets killed or whatever, now might be the time to go away and then come back. But if you're not bothered or you've seen the movie, which I'm sure most of you have, please feel free to stick around. But that is a spoiler warning, guys. Now, I remember having a very good time with this movie back in the day, but this was only my second viewing of Scream 4. So did I enjoy it as much as the first time? Let's find out. Once again, Wes Craven does return to direct this movie. He directed the other three and he returns for the fourth instalment, which is some going for a director to direct that many movies in a franchise. Unfortunately, this is the last movie that Wes Craven made before he died. Rest in peace, Wes. And this has returning cast members Neve Campbell, David Arquette, Courtney Cox, but also sees a few newcomers here. Rory Culkin, Macaulay Culkin's brother, Emma Roberts and Hayden Pantier. And in this movie, we return to Woodsboro on the anniversary, believe it or not, of the killings from the first movie. And Sydney Prescott is attending a book signing on her new book about all her past troubles in her life. And of course, the killings start up again. And we're left to wonder who is committing these murders in this whodunit slasher movie. And I actually think it was a good idea to return to Woodsboro, but it's just weird to see all these ghost face masks hanging off lampposts and... The stab of on events where everyone gets together and watches the stab movies, which of course are based on the killings. They're the movies within the movie. But I don't know if that would sit right in real life with everyone celebrating people being murdered. But it's come sort of a cult following in this town, like their own mini Halloween. But as a personal side note, I just like the look of Woodsboro. It looks like a nice little town to live in, to be honest. And it was a good little filming location. And although I did like the setting and the story that Scream 3 had, it wasn't too good in its execution. This is much more simplified with the added touch of the killer wanting to film everything. And, you know, I like that. It was just an easier watch. It doesn't complicate itself. And that's all this movie has to be because it's just a slasher movie at the end of the day. And Signe has basically accepted her life in this one. She's gone from being stronger in every movie to being the strongest that she can't actually be. And she's wrote a book in this, like I mentioned, and I don't actually blame her for making a bit of money off this. She's been through hell. Why not turn it into a little bit of a positive? But she's also using this book to help other people. So her personal character still remains there. And, you know, I weren't a fan of her in the first movie. I admitted that in my Scream, scream review, but... I do think she's got better over these movies and a very likeable character. And I actually cared whether she died or not, so... Uh, Sydney, as the movies have gone on, has really, really grew on me as a character. And getting on to Gail Weathers in this movie, I absolutely loved her as a character. She's so feisty, feistier than ever. But <laughs> she just argues with every single person she comes across in this movie. But you're always on her side because she's right. Like, one person she always argues with in this is Deputy Judy. And she's always making little cakes for Dewey and flirting with him and stuff. And it's like, yeah, I'm on Gail's side there. But she just takes no shit off anyone. And I just think she's become a better person in these movies. But still, to the core, she's still got that anger inside her. And that's what makes Gail Weathers in these movies for me. Also, Dewey is quite good in this movie. The only one he's really been off in is Scream 2. He just seemed like a little bit of a different character. A little more goofier in that one. And Hayden Pantier is a great character in this. The fact that she's a horror movie fanatic in the movie probably made me like her a little bit more. But she's a great actress. I don't know where her career is sort of going now. But I thought she'd be at the top when I first seen her back in the day in this. And she was in Heroes too. But she's a great actress. One of the most likeable characters in the Scream franchise actually. And we also have Emma Roberts playing Jill. And I'll get to her a little bit later on. But... She was fantastic in the second half of this movie, but I'll come to her in a minute. Also, we have the rules explained once again in this movie, and Randy usually does this, and it went from horror movies to sequels to trilogies, and now we're on a remake. This isn't actually a remake, but in the movie, they sort of explain how remakes or horror remakes are done. And the killer is sort of filming all these killings, so he's trying to remake his own movie. 
So basically, that's what it's talking about. Uh, the two film geeks who were uh, film geek like me, <laughs> who were in their film class and explaining to everyone how to survive a horror movie, and I just thought it was quite funny where. You can't survive these days and the only way to actually survive a horror movie in the modern day is you pretty much have to be gay and that's what one of the characters Charlie says <laughs> and I just found it so funny later on when Robbie who's the other film the film geek is being killed and he just goes no no I'm gay <laughs> and I just thought that was absolutely hilarious but of course he's still he's still killed anyway. Also, the ghost face killer in this, his voice is spot on. Probably the best since one, but I haven't mentioned Roger Jackson in any of these reviews yet. And I should have. He deserves more credit for doing the voice. I don't even think he uses anything to enhance it when I looked it up online. And there's one scene in this movie where <laughs> Sydney's agent is in the parking lot and she gets a call from the ghost face killer. And she lies that she's in a hospital. And then a car alarm goes off <laughs> and the ghost face killer just says... Doesn't sound like you're in the hospital. Sounds like you're in a parking lot. I can put you in the hospital though. In a fucking morgue! And like I said guys, I watched this back in 2011. Remember really enjoying it. And I remember Jill actually being the killer in this movie. But there was one scene where Jill's friend is being killed over the road. And she's hunched out the back of a window. It's a great kill scene. And she's just staring at her friends. And Jill is in the other house. And I was like, hmm. Is there another killer in this? I totally forgot that Rory Culkin's character, Charlie, is the other killer. So, the fact that I'd seen it and still didn't get onto who the killer was by the end of the movie, you know, to the other killer, was a great way of masking who the killer is, like it did in Scream 1 and 2, not so much 3, I've explained my reasons for that. So it was good that it played along with the audience. I also asked my fiancé near the end of the movie who she thinks it is, and she had no idea. And when the big reveal happens, it's done very, very well in my opinion, apart from one little nitpick I'll just get to in a minute, but, you know, Jill, who's been this normal character all the way through the movie, turned into this complete psychopath, and she's enjoying killing all these people, and she's doing it because Sydney's getting all the attention, and she wants to make herself the lone survivor, so of course she fucks Charlie over, she's meant to stab him in the arm, she stabs him right through the heart, and she's just ruthless. She she enjoys killing all these people. And she, in one scene in a movie, she even kills a mum. And she said, oh, I have to even kill my mother for this, but it went no fucking great loss. And it's just like, whoa, what a heartless, heartless bitch. But uh, the one little nitpick I have, she doesn't finish Sydney off. She stabs her once. And, of course, Sydney is not dead. So when they both get to the hospital, Dewey informs Jill that Sydney's going to make it. And, and Jill sort of goes to Sydney's room to try and strangle her and finish it off. But Dewey, Gail and Deputy Judy all get onto it. So they run in the room and try and stop Jill. But basically Jill's just got a gun pointed at them all and she's, she just wants to kill all these motherfuckers. She is a total psychopath in this movie and it was a magnificent performance from Emma Roberts. It really was. Right? She is, she really, really could play the psychopathic role here. I thought she was magnificent. I don't really have many negatives for this movie, guys. This one is more of a mixed mixed bag of thoughts here because there was things I liked and things I didn't. And it's the opening scene, which has probably been the strongest point of each movie. This one's a little bit different. It opens, of course, with two killings or two girls being killed. But once they're killed, it just says stab six on the TV. So it was a movie. And these other two girls are watching it. And next minute she turns around and kills a friend. And then it says stab seven. <laughs> so yeah, they're not real kills. the stab movie kills. And the last two girls who are eventually killed by Ghostface. And it says scream four. So it was a movie within a movie within a movie. Within a movie. <laughs> I don't know if it worked really. But one thing I will give it is the kills were very well done. It was very tense. And it tricked the audience, you know, I didn't, obviously I thought after the first one they're not going to surely do it again, but they did. I just don't know if it worked and it was a bit stupid. Maybe one time would have worked a little bit better, I don't know, but it's sort of parried in itself really, isn't it? 
And I just want to quickly get on to a couple of negatives I do have with this movie, guys. And it's the two cops who are sitting outside the house garden, garden Jill, because they think she's in danger, even though she's the killer. And they're talking about, like, it's not good to be a cop in a movie because you, you'd end up being killed no matter what, unless you're Bruce Willis. And later on, the two cops are killed and one is stabbed right through the head. It's a quite a gruesome scene, actually. But the kill is totally ruined because the guy falls to his knees and goes, Fuck Bruce Willis, man. I don't think you're going to say that if you're about to just drop dead. <laughs> and... When I said about the joke before about Robbie saying I'm gay, don't kill me, that one actually worked. But this one was just a little bit too comedic and did not did not hit the right notes with me. It just totally seemed unbelievable. It was it just didn't need to he didn't need to say that. It was just too comedic for me. Also, the guy who plays Trevor in this movie is horrific. He is just a horrible, annoying character who I hated. But the worst thing about it is the guy who's playing him just could not act. <laughs> His acting was so bad and it took me out of the experience. It was so wooden and unbelievable. Look, I'm not going to name the guy. If you really want to look him up, you can find him online. But I'm not that type of person. But <laughs> look, I hope it works out for the guy. His career is still going. And a perfect example of me seeing bad actors turn good is Charlie Hunnam in Green Street. I think he's absolutely horrific in that. But in The Gentleman, he's absolutely fantastic. So, you know, good luck to him. I hope his career goes on. But this is an early movie for him. So it's sort of forgivable, but it just sort of ruined some scenes in this movie that he was in for me. So I'm just going to go ahead and rate Scream 4 now. I'm going to give Scream 4 a 7.5 out of 10. I really enjoyed this entry just as much as I did the first time. It's a decent, decent fourth movie to have. And I really hope they make a Scream 5, to be honest, I'm not going to lie. So at the end of these reviews, I always like to leave a little fun fact. Now, the fun fact for this is when the movie at the Stabathon comes up, Stab, it says directed by Robert Rodriguez. And I thought, oh, that's a funny little joke. But after looking it up, he actually directed that Stab segment. <laughs> and they used part of it for this movie, which is bad. Just mad. Okay, guys, I hope you all enjoyed this Scream 4 review and me other Scream reviews if you've been watching them. You know, I've got my Scream ranking franchise coming next, so look out for that. I'm also thinking about ranking every Ghostface killer. There's been four movies, but seven killers. Some way better than others, so I'm thinking about maybe doing that, but maybe next week or something like that. That'll just be a little fun video. And if you want more videos, guys, please subscribe. It's up to yourself. If you want to comment about Scream 4 or any of the Scream movies, I will reply to every single one of you, I promise. Okay, guys, take it all easy, and I'll see you all in the next video.